uh, first, let's give you a little background. This is kind of the uh, picture of where we're headed. This is from the cover of The Economist. This is kind of the iconic sense of, I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't see anybody walking around drinking something, you know, and now it's like everywhere. People always are walking around drinking something or eating something. Um, our culture has really changed. And uh, why that is actually um, is really because of marketing and the industry, right? They've been very successful in making this normative behavior in our lives. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you a little background on the science of obesity and the trends, what we know about the causes of the epidemic. Uh, most of it is not rocket science, even though you'll read stuff that makes it sound like really rocket science complicated. Most of it is not that, sim well, not that complicated. People make billions of dollars getting us all fat. It's not that complicated. Um, we'll talk about the different environments and where marketing you know, enters our lives and makes a difference. And um, talk about uh, some of the best opportunities for prevention. And spend a little extra time on sugar-sweetened beverages because I think they're the one part of the whole system right now that is probably most primed to see some substantial change. Uh, because most folks are like you and they realize this stuff is not good for us. What are we doing consuming all of this uh, sugar water? Uh, and we can uh, turn it around. Um, I think you know all this stuff. I mean, obesity has been increasing throughout the United States for the past 30 years. We find increases in all parts of the U.S., whether you're rich or poor. I mean, everybody's increasing in obesity. There are some differences here, though, that I'll talk about in a minute in a little more detail. Uh, probably all of you have seen these slides from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention showing adult obesity trends. It's how many of you have, have seen this sequence of slides? Uh, about a third. I'll just run through quickly. This is uh, prevalence of obesity in 1990 among adults across states. So it's a little higher if it's darker. There are a couple of states where there weren't any data back then. But you can just go from year to year and see it increasing, like 91, 92. See how things are getting darker? 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. See, things are turning yellow. This is a prevalence of now 20% among the adult population, 99. 2000, 2001, see it's, it's turning red now in Mississippi, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. Starting to get out greater than 30% in West Virginia and Mississippi now, 2006, 2007. So just in uh, 17 years here, you see a dramatic increase in the prevalence of obesity among adults just in the last 17 years, or 18 years, you know, or 19 years. It's um, increasing dramatically. Um, actually, there's, it's funny, this one keeps on popping up in uh, Colorado. Actually, they have a, yeah, they're a little lower prevalence. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, uh, Massachusetts is a little lower prevalence, too. I mean, the big thing in, in, in Colorado, though, is that most everybody lives at 5,000 feet. And if you live at 5,000 feet, you burn a little more energy no matter what you do. So that is an intervention. If we want to lower the rate of obesity, it's just really expensive to move, that, to move everybody to 5,000 feet. So that's what's been happening on the U.S. Now, if we look at kids, uh, here's some recent work we've done just to actually uh, point out how we may have start, started to turn a corner. Um, among kids, the percentage of kids obese has just increased from about 5%. I mean, the first studies I was doing were back around here, actually. It's increased from 5% to 17%. Um, and just most recently, it kicked down, you know, in 2006. You know, it started to move down a little bit. Um, first time in all these years you kind of saw that. Um, it's fascinating, I was at an international meeting, we have an international modeling group, and we see exactly the same downturn at the same point in time in England. It's kind of interesting. What's causing that? Uh, we think it's probably the same kind of things going on, but uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, clearly there are big air bars around this. These are 95% confidence intervals, so you know, it's like we say there's evidence for a downward trend, but not exactly sure 
that's true. I mean, we certainly see some evidence for leveling off. Um, if you look at it by um, age groups, you see evidence for a decline among 2 to 5, 6 to 11, not among the teenagers. Kind of makes sense. I mean, if you think, where could you start to make changes in kids' relative energy balance, diet, physical activity? Probably more with the young kids. High school kids are kind of on their own, you know, and middle school kids. So that's where we're seeing the first changes. Um, it, it is interesting to look at differences by racial ethnic groups. Like if you look at, um, so these show the prevalence of obesity for white, black, and Hispanic kids throughout this period of time. And you see that in the most recent period here, there's big disparities, almost two to one differences in rates of obesity with higher rates among black and Hispanic kids. And among the white kids, things have been relatively flat. You know, if you take, if you think about these air bars, you know, relatively flat for probably, you know, seven, eight, nine years. Um, Similar sorts of things are going on among the adolescents. You see again, overall the upward trend, but if you were to look at just the white population, it's been relatively flat for a number of years. These data are always old, by the way. You know, you always are looking at old data. We don't, mm -hmm. the newest data will come out this uh, December for the next two year period. And, um, if you look at it by income, you see the same kind of patterns. Increasing prevalence of, among low-income kids, it's been pretty flat among higher-income kids. So these trends are real and, kind of, and uh, similar sorts of things among um, teenagers. Let's talk about what's causing this. Well, I mean, here's the stuff that's not really rocket science. Um, obesity is caused by more energy intake than you're burning off. Um, we've um, actually modeled out the energy imbalance that's been driving the epidemic. And there has been a lot of publicity about a study that appeared in Science about, I think it was about five, six years ago, where they talked about the fact that the obesity epidemic among adults was being driven by just a small uh, excess intake. They said it's on average about 30 extra calories a day. It's kind of stunning. And they said for 90% of the population, just 100 calories a day could um, explain what was happening. Unfortunately, that paper in science was actually wrong. <laughs> they actually got the science wrong because they forgot about the fact that as you gain excess weight, you actually burn a lot more calories just doing your normal movement because your metabolic rate is higher and or you burn more energy not because your resting metabolic rate is higher but because you're moving a greater mass around it's actually a chance to use a little differential equation uh, and we modeled that and what we found is that actually for kids what was driving the epidemic for the period from 1990 to 2000 what was driving that increase was on average in excess of about 110 to 165 calories per day per kid. I mean, I mean, that was driving the average excess weight gain. But for kids to become obese, you really have to have an excess of 600 to 1,000 calories a day over 10 years to put on all the extra weight that you saw in the population, which for kids who become obese, they put on an in excess of about 58 pounds, I think, on average uh, during that period. So it's not just a small difference. It's a much larger difference. If you want to move someone into becoming obese, it's not just an extra 50 calories a day. It's not just an extra 100 calories a day. It's more like an extra 600 to 1,000 calories a day. So when you see one of those big gulps, you know, those 600 calorie big gulps, yeah, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about what the, you know, 100 calories or 50 calories or 30 calories. Um, this is really important because I think a lot of people have gotten fooled into thinking, all I gotta do is, you know, just change 100 calories a day. It's a good place to start. But if we really wanna prevent obesity, you gotta have bigger changes. Um, but the other thing that is really important is that social context is really important. Um, 
if sugar sweetened beverages are everywhere, if they're in school, if they're in home, if they're in our workplace, it's so cool to not see them here, huh? You know, we've got water, it's so cool. You know, like, I can't tell you how many business meetings and talks I go to and how embarrassing it is, you know, because it's like there's sugar sweetened beverages all over the room and there's a, you know, and uh, this is starting to change, you know, but it's, uh, it's an issue. Um, and here's that background too. I mean, I'm not going to walk through how we do the analysis, but we actually um, say, well, what would happen if kids um, grew the way they're supposed to, you know, developing their bone muscle and everything, and growing in height and everything, um, and they uh, didn't gain excess, and then we can say, well, here's actually what the reality is, and then we can calculate what drove that difference. And uh, we, we have a whole model for how that happens. And I think, as I mentioned before, this is my one chance to actually apply some of the calculus I learned in high school. You know, I mean, you never get to write out differential equations, uh, but it is a nonlinear um, equation. And here are these uh, excess energy gaps. And again, on average, kids gain 10 pounds over 10 years, or about an excess pound a year during this period of time. And what was driving that was this excess intake in that range. And for the kids that became obese, they had gained an extra 58 pounds. And in order to get there, they had to have this kind of excess intake over expenditure during that period of time. Uh, by the way, that 10 pounds over 10 years or a pound a year, that's kind of what the adult population was doing too. You may have had that experience of going into your doctor, you know, I remember talking to my doctor, and he says, well, gee, you know, you know, I finally just charted your weight, and you know you've gained 10 pounds over the last 10 years. I said, well, great, thanks for telling me 10 years later, you know. <laughs> but that's pretty typical. Uh, doctors are starting to get a little more proactive now. Yeah, question? Can you, sorry, can, I don't know, can you explain that again? So are you saying that, like, if you grow normally, you sh they should get to a certain level. They should stay in whatever percentile they're in, and then that by the end of 10 years, they would be 10 pounds over what they should be at? Or No, the kids gained, on average, an excess of 10 pounds over what their normal growth should be over the period 1990 to 2000. Okay. That was what happened. And the question is, well, how much excess intake over expenditures cause that increase? And that's the answer. Okay. That's, does that make sense? It, it is, by the way, I didn't um, go into this in detail just because it's a little complicated and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. But you can read the paper uh, okay. that's referenced at the bottom. Because there is always like a bell curve for weight, you know. I mean, some people are just. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and what we did was we just modeled out um, the fact that you start with a whole distribution, and if all those kids underwent normal growth over 10 years, here's where they'd be. But instead, the distribution didn't look like that. It, looked, it didn't look like that. It looked like that. I mean, these are schematics, not the actual data, although it actually looks quite a lot like that. Just, yeah, you had a question. And where do you get the data from? The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is called NHANES, is this big national survey where they actually have mobile examining centers and they go all over the United States and they actually weigh and measure kids, they take skin folds, they do um, actually a whole range of measures of body composition, they take blood samples, they collect detailed uh, dietary data, they have kids wear accelerometers every day for a week and figure out just how physically active they are. Right. Yeah. Is that a government? Uh, yep. It's uh, conducted by the Centers for Disease Contro yeah. Control and Prevention, the National Center for Health Statistics. And it's continuously ongoing. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's actually good quality data. Yeah, you had a question over here? No. Um, just to give you a sense of, well, what could lead to an extra 100, 10, 165 calories a day. Um, well, here are a couple of options. Um, how can we uh, get rid of 150 calories or something like that? Well, one thing you could do is re you could replace one can of soda with water. That'd be 140 calories a day. 
That's pretty easy to do. Um, we found in a number of studies that as kids watch television, they, they consume excess um, energy. It's, why do they spend billions marketing on TV? Because it works. Kids consume more. And we found that for each extra hour of TV watching, that's about 106 calories a day. That's another way to you know, get more intake. Um, you can do a little calculation here. If you're a kid about 10 years old, you could replace 1.9 hours of sitting with 1.9 hours of walking, and that'll burn 150 calories. It's kind of a fascinating little comparison here. If you tell a kid, well, you, you could do this, or you could just replace one can of soda with water. Which one do you want to do? Which one's easier? <laughs> or ask yourself as an adult that question, because it's not that much different. You don't have to walk for as long, because you weigh more, and you'll burn more. But it's like my favorite uh, question for people who are, are, are into sports strengths. is like, you know, what are you doing? You know, you just worked out for an hour. You burned off you know, 120 calories, and then you had a sports strength, and you put it all back. What's the point? Yeah. What are you doing? You don't, I mean, if you're running a marathon, you know, you do want to replace some electrolytes and stuff and get some energy, but unless you're running a marathon, you don't need sports strength. No one needs a sports strength. Um, it's actually amazing what the marketing has done to our thought process. You know, I play a sport, I need a sports strength. Um, and anyway, no one, well, this is kind of a personal thing. I was a long distance runner and I was really lucky. I had a great coach. I never had any injuries, but no one should run a marathon. I mean, it just damages your joints. I mean, it really does. I mean, I, I, mean, I was lucky my coach never let us run marathons and we had people setting records in two miles and stuff, you know. Marathons, it's too far, you know, it's like, oh, sorry, this is, and I probably shouldn't have said that, but I, 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 I just have to point that out. Do you know what happened to the guy that ran the first marathon, right? Uh, uh, the other thing that you can do is uh, increase PE from one to three times a week. That would be about uh, extra 30-some calories a day. You, you, know, you know, that can help and burn stuff. Um, so there are a variety of ways to sort of close that energy gap. But I think you're getting the idea that it's probably easiest to do interventions on the intake side than it is on the uh, physical activity side because it's just a little more time intensive. And yet I think both are really important I mean, for a whole range of reasons. Also, physical activity is really good for cardiovascular health and good for mental health, a whole range of stuff. It's fun, you know. Okay, what's driving all this stuff? Well, I mean, here's where it's... It's again not rocket science. I mean, food producers, the fast food industry, you know, if they're successful, we all eat more, right? And they've been really successful at this. Think of how they've entered your consciousness in so many ways and made you desire. I mean, I, mean, I um, well, well, we'll talk about the TV and marketing later, but it's really important. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I took this picture about a, 10 years ago. And it's still a dollar. You know, it's still a dollar, all this stuff, you know? Kind of amazing, you know? Actually, you can't get all these things now for a buck, but the most of them you can still get for a buck. It's amazing. You know, they've really made it easy to consume a lot of calories. Um, I love this quote from some of my colleagues at Children's Hospital. Large fast food meal, double cheeseburger, french fries, soft drink, contains 2,200 calories, which would require a child a full marathon to burn off. You know, why do we give these kids this? Well, it's a way to get that extra 600 to 1,000 calories a day you need to pile on the pounds, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, um, I think one of the more cynical things I could imagine is uh, the playgrounds at McDonald's, you know, where kids yeah. go and play for 10 minutes, burn, you know, 40 calories, and then go and consume 2,000. You know, it's like sick stuff. Um, Oh, yeah, that was, that was kind of, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, yeah, you know the, what the joke is there. Yeah, we did a study showing well, that actually they tend to cluster fast food restaurants around schools. You actually can't tell that from the map there. I, I just thought the map was kind of cool. But, um, um, we found that on kids, 
or, or on days that kids go to a fast food restaurant, they consume an extra 126 calories a day. Kind of interesting. You know, once you walk into a fast food restaurant, you just consume extra calories. Um, the, I mean, this was a study where we compared the same kids on days where they did not and did go to a fast food restaurant, so it's kind of a cool study. Um, we also found that you know, actually higher income kids actually consume more than lower income kids at, at fast food restaurants. So it's not like fast food is something that only poor people engage in. No, not at all. You know, it's something that, I mean, you've probably had the experience if you have kids, you know, of, of letting your kids go on a play date with someone else and then the mom or, or the kids say, oh yeah, we went to so-and-so and we got all we could eat. And you go, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, question. Yeah, that, that kind of counters your graph that you showed earlier with income showing that the higher income kind of balance out whereas low income. Oh, but that graph before was on obesity and this is on fast food. Yeah, but aren't you saying that fast food is one of the major causes of obesity? It helps to contribute, sure, but uh, yeah, they don't have to. I mean, I think that when we get into talking about, uh, for example, sugar-sweetened beverages, we'll see that most of the sugar-sweetened beverages kids consume, they consume at home. You know, most of the food that kids consume, they consume at home. And so definitely fast food helps to contribute in the marketing of processed food and a whole, and, um, uh, high caloric uh, density, low nutritional quality food is part of what we're going on, but fast food is just part of it. Most of it is actually still in the home, and yet it's the stuff that's marketed on TV that tends to alter our diet. So it's, um, I think you're right. I mean, it sounds a little out of sync, well, but I think it's consistent. Um, all kids eat a lot of fast food but it's still only a few times a week, you know what I mean? And uh, the difference here is I think um, on a given day, I think it's something like if you're poor, 25% of kids will eat fast food and 34% of wealthy kids. So it's still a lot of kids eat fast food. Um, let's talk about sugar, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. This is my current uh, thing I'm really focusing on. I started out focusing a lot on television, and, and we'll talk about that later because of the marketing. But uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, I think, are probably the one area where we have the greatest potential to make a big dent in the next uh, decade in this epidemic. Um, there have been some nice um, review studies which have reviewed a huge body of evidence which shows a direct relationship between sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and excess weight gain, increased risk of obesity in youth. And here are the three reviews. One interesting aside to this, two separate studies, um, I, I, I don't think I show it here, two separate studies indicate that industry-financed research tends not to show a relationship between sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and obesity, and non-industry-funded research shows a big relationship. This is actually a huge issue. It's kind of like the drug industry research. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot going on here that's kind of really undocumented. Um, but there are two studies. And the Vartanian study actually shows this. It's in the American Journal of Public Health. You know, Industry-funded studies tend not to show a relationship. There are lots of connections here. Um, you mentioned uh, Coca-Cola is a favorite beverage. You know, Coke is one of the big. Uh, of course, industry players, um, they have a foundation arm called the, Inst the, um, the International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI, uh, better known as uh, the Coca-Cola Foundation. Um, they actually fund a journal called Nutrition Reviews. Yeah. You know, and um, so there are all these industry relationships, and you really have to wonder about the quality of the science and at one point, must have been 10 years ago, I was disinvited to give a talk at an <laughs> ILSI funded conference because I was going to talk about sugar sweetened beverages. Kind of one of these striking things. And two of my colleagues have had the same things happen. And yet they represent themselves as a, an independent foundation, although I think the, the World Health Organization just kicked them out of their uh, 
have some kind of group that you can be part of, and then they kick them out of that. I mean, so there's a lot of issues here about who funds research and um, how that research is then summed up. You have to take into account uh, who funds the research. Can't trust at all. Which is a tricky issue, actually, as you know from the world of drug research. And this is the kind of stuff that I get a little worried about putting on tape. But I won't tell you any more stories about it. Um, we did this study, actually, back in um, 2001 in The Lancet, which showed that as kids increased their consumption of sugar-sweetened beverage, it led to a direct increase in obesity. And this was the first study showing this in kids. And it's interesting, because of all my research, this is the most highly cited study. It's got over 1,000 sites now. Interesting. Um, there's evidence that if you reduce intake of sugar-sweetened beverage, you could reduce overweight. This was a cluster randomized trial in Britain where they were, I mean, they actually reduced uh, what they called fizzy beverages, which is kind of funny. Um, the same relationships you see in kids, you also see in adults. Here's a study in, uh, fr from the Nurses' Health Study, which is uh, colleagues at Harvard did this. As women increase their consumption of sugar-sweetened beverage, it relates directly to increases in obesity and increases in diabetes incidence. Um, how? Well, part of the issue is just you have excess calories. But one thing that's interesting here is it appears that individuals do not really compensate for excess liquid calories by reducing consumption of calories from solid food. It seems like it bypasses uh, some of your satiety mechanisms. Mm -hmm. When you fill your stomach, you get these signals that says, I'm full, I want to stop eating. But when you're drinking a liquid, it just seems to go right by the system. Um, there's been a lot of talk of, well, is high fructose corn syrup different than um, uh, regular sugar? And I've talked to people all over the world, um, uh, colleagues who are supposed to be experts in this, and and I've really come to the conclusion that thus far we have no evidence that uh, high fructose corn syrup is any different really than standard sugar or crystalline sugar or, or fructose in terms of um, its impact on gaining excess weight and obesity. I'd like to believe it uh, because I'd like to stop subsidizing an industry, but I really don't see the science there. I think. Uh, we do a lot to subsidize the sugar industry. We keep out sugar from, from other countries by imposing tariffs. We subsidize high fructose corn syrup. I think we should just cut out all these subsidies and we'd probably be doing ourselves a favor. Um, but I think uh, all of the sugar in sugar-sweetened beverages just add calories and we don't need them. What can we replace sugar-sweetened beverages with? Um, water. Water. We have a nice study, actually, studying the same kids on different days as they move into different levels of beverage consumption. And you see, as you replace sugar-sweetened beverages with water, kids actually consume fewer calories. It really kind of works. Public water supplies are really important. Uh, an interesting question for you is, do you have water supplies in your school? Are there water supplies in your ball fields? I actually just did this, a, a version of this talk in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. This is where I went to graduate school. And I met with some people from the State Department of Public Health there. And they said they could identify a few high schools where the principals had shut down the water fountains because they found they could make more money from the sugar-sweetened beverage sales. And they could identify those. It was like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting. It's been really, I provide water for my students in class. I brought a lot of just a pump, so it's at room temperature, but I get to pull and spring water and bring it into my room and have it, and I have a pump so they can have water. And they do drink less of the sugary. We don't allow. We only allow water, but they still sneak in all the sugary drinks. But it's interesting, uh -huh. and I've been bringing in fresh fruit, and uh -huh. it's just yeah. providing it, but the school's resistance to provide it, that that's a lot of money, and we don't even have a bubbler on the third floor. The bubblers are only on, I think, the first floor, first or second. But it's just amazing. My students love it, that they're allowed to just have water. It's a big treat. So it's, it's kind of amazing. Interesting. And, it's so and why don't they have drinking fountains or bubblers? Well, they have them on the other floors. It's, we're in a really old building. 
so. Uh, so they just don't do the plumbing to make. Right. I, mean, I mean, I think yeah. it's a. Uh, if you look at the water from the Quabbin Reservoir, it's quite good um, in Massachusetts. And, and I'm stunned at the places that actually pay for, like Poland Springs water, because you really don't need it. And it's actually bottled water is less regulated than the public water supplies. We have, we have problems in New Bedford with the water because of the, a lot of our schools were, were built on toxic waste dumps and mm -hmm. different things. But, you know, we, I mean, the water is okay from New Bedford. Yeah, you can, some you can have it tested. It, uh -huh. Actually, we're doing a little project like this summer with the school system, really, to help them move from paying for Poland Springs water to move to uh, uh, Quabbin Reservoir water. And I think you just have to do some testing. And uh, yeah. um, it's a great area, though, for working with community partners to, to figure out how to get water into your schools. I mean, maybe it's not an issue, or into your... Um, town ball fields or playing fields. I know I live in Belmont and the, uh, my kids will be going to high school next year and uh, our ball fields and playing fields don't have water. You know, why is that? You know, interesting. In the high school, the one fountain in the, in the big gym doesn't work well. Like, why is that? You know, this is, like, this is not rocket science, you know. Um, Replacing water with low-fat milk will not cut calories. Uh, the issue of uh, artificial sweeteners, or actually the preferred phrase now, is non-nutritive uh, sweeteners. Because, uh, the, I mean, what's a new one? Uh, it's one of the new ones is natural. It's not artificial. Um, uh, stevia, right, yeah. It's uh, natural. Uh, I don't like them. Um, because I think it just introduces more sweetness into the lives of our kids that they then become conditioned to that and that's what they want. And it's been a huge issue in the food industry. Um, one way to make money with almost any product is to add sugar to it. Um, the industry, if, if you talk to industry executives, they've done all these studies, you know, like with uh, tomato sauce for pasta. You know, you do a little study, you put out your product, and then after a while, you add high fructose corn syrup, and your sales go up. You go, well, hey, this is a no-brainer. And, and that's happened throughout uh, lots of areas of the food industry. Just add more and more sweet sweetener to all kinds of foods. And artificial sweeteners are now becoming very popular. And so I just don't like it. And then my favorite fun fact, um, who was CEO of Searle when aspartame was approved by the FDA? Aspartame, I, it's kind of a sleazy process with kind of questionable data. Mm -hmm. Can anybody identify the CEO of Searle when uh, aspartame was approved? Oh that, oh, that would be Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not a Republican, so I, I always like that kind of fun fact. Okay, um, more about sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, where do we consume them, and what do we consume? Well, I mean, these are data for kids. This is an article we published in 2008. And let's talk about, I mean, this age group here, the 12 to 19 year olds. Well, first of all, the thing that's tricky is kids consume lots of different kinds of sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and if you add them all up, you get like the 320, 340 calories a day. So remember what I was talking before about uh, what was driving the obesity epidemic is extra 150 calories a day, or if kids become obese, the, 600, well, you see where a lot of this is coming from? Isn't that kind of stunning? It's because there are so many different varieties of sugar sweetened beverage. When we uh, went into the NHANES database, uh, we had to code about 450 different beverages. There's a lot of them there. Um, there's soda, which is still the biggest chunk. There are all the different fruit punches, we call them fruit drinks or juice drinks, or you know, there's endless varieties. Sports drinks are still a relatively small category, but they're the fastest growing group. Then you have other sugar sweetened beverages and 100% juice, which is a smaller thing for teenagers. It's a bigger issue for younger kids. So lots of different sugar sweetened beverages, lots of different forms. It's all the same stuff in the end. It's sugar and water. Um, where do we consume them? It's interesting, you know, kids, um, on weekdays consume some of their sugar sweetened beverages 
in school. You know, that's the yellow. But overall, it's only about 10-12% of the sugar-sweetened beverages are consumed in schools. The number one place would be at home. After that, I suppose, mm, other people's houses, and then fast food restaurants, and school, and um, on, on the street, I don't know, a range of places. But home is still the major spot. So if you want to make changes, and you can talk about some very simple things. Just don't bring them home. Uh, how much sugar-sweetened beverages do children consume? I just actually calculated these kind of data about a few months ago. It's kind of cool. I calculated that children and youth, ages 2 to 19, consume 7 point trillion calories in sugar-sweetened beverage per year. I like the trillion because it reminded me of these uh, big financial numbers, you know, with the financial industry. In dollars, if we say that's 50 cents a can, which is, I mean, you, you can get it cheaper, you know, you get Costco and stuff. This would be $24 billion a year we spend on sugar-sweetened beverages for kids. How did we get here spending this amount of money? So, um, and these beverages can be replaced with water at virtually no cost. So that's your thought for today, you know. Huge waste of money, you know, huge waste of money. Um, <laughs> thank you very much.